to Texas A&M in 2012 and got involved with the CC Compass team. And that team is primarily responsible for developing tools and software to do the continuous commissioning process. And that is all the phases from opportunity assessment, energy modeling, trend data analytics, and monitoring and verification. And so I was a big part of getting that off the ground. And that's where a lot of, um, you know, I was interested, I've always been a computer nerd in some sense, but that's where um, a lot of the skills kind of took off. But I'm a mechanical engineer at heart. I'm in the HVAC world. And so I, I bring a, a, a unique blend of mechanical engineering and HVAC and com computation, and I bring it together. And this is titled Skills You Need to Know About. So take this as an awareness of how things could be, things you may want to explore. I'm not trying to tell you this is how you should do your work. Okay, Everyone can work how they like. But I think a lot of these things may may start opening your mind to some new avenues for how to do computation as an engineer. So we only had about five of you here for part one. So I'll just recap what, what points I tried to make last year and a half or so ago. And that conversation, I really was focused on version control and Git. All right. So version controlling in general, how important that was to have a log and a transaction of, of what you've done in a project so that you could go back to previous states, what did I send my client on this day, to know that nothing has changed from your colleagues. And if you're going to do that, what what is my suggestion for you to learn in the concrete? Well, the way things have gone, and even more so since I gave that talk, everything is done in Git, G-I-T, and source code repositories are hosted on GitHub, which is now actually owned by Microsoft. So if you're looking for programs and you're looking to collaborate, Git and GitHub are the way to go. That's where I would suggest someone starts. The second half, a little less focused, was on document preparation in LaTeX. And in particular, I was trying to expose people to kind of the gateway drug to this, which was uh, a service called overleaf.com, which got you started in the, the mental model of, I'm going to write my my document in a markup language, and it's going to compile to a final project. Okay. Today, we're going to take things a little bit further. So we have a lot to cover today. Um, I think all of it will be interesting enough. I'm going to start with some little side projects that I've worked on that are particular to people working in HVAC. I have two online tools that are free and open source, and if you guys want to contribute, you can. Tell them who about the 664 port. Uh, oh, I, I had previously TA'd 664, so if anyone's in 664, I had done that twice, and so if you see real fancy looking homework solutions, those are myself, and I did 665 once or twice as well, back a couple years back. I'm gonna go over a couple terms when it comes to what, what is a terminal, a shell, command line. I'm gonna cover the Windows subsystem for Linux. I'm gonna do a quick example of document preparation using Pandoc is a tool, building projects, and then I'm going to sum it all up in kind of like my, a real life example of uh, Energy Plus and how I built an Energy Plus using this, these, these types of techniques. So to start, I'm going to go to a website, and some of you have computers, so you can kind of go to this site if you want, and that is cyprochart.com. Okay? And so if you go to cyclochart.com, you're presented with what you would expect, a psychometric chart. Okay? Now there are other online psychometric charts, but you know, they're all great, but this one is mine. Right? And what is special about this one is it's a little bit more dynamic. So this is a SVG image and it's vector art, so it's very nice and clean, but it also has a couple options. You can turn off lines of constant values so if I don't, like my wet bulb lines, I think they're intrusive. I can turn them off. And then what's nice is that you can actually adjust this chart and have it rebuild dynamically. So the standard ASHRAE chart that you'd find in the fundamentals book is going to be up to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if you're talking about uh, HVAC systems that aren't heating air, so you're talking about where the max temperature is mostly going to be outdoor temperature, you may only want this chart down to 100 degrees. 
and you can see how that chart is now updated. Um, we can bring this uh, max humidity ratio down to kind of squish this chart. Right? And all of these labels and all of this um, remains very nice looking. Okay? Did a lot of calculating of derivatives to get those slopes just right. <laughs> And I think probably the, the coolest one or the most important one is the total pressure. So if I want to make myself a custom psychometric chart that's as a high a resolution as I want, I can play with this and put this um, total pressure to whatever my site is. And it also kind of serves as a nice, uh, useful teaching tool to see visually how does the psychometric chart change when I decrease the pressure. So I can kind of click through here. And you'll see kind of the edges moving. And what you'll find is actually the properties don't change all that much with difference in altitude or difference in atmospheric pressure. The one thing you may have missed, though, is these lines of specific volume, these were really cruising across, right? So if there's one parameter in psychometrics that changes a lot with atmospheric pressure, it's specific volume or density. And that's what people are most aware of, right? Air gets less dense as you go higher up or the specific volume uh, goes the opposite direction. And then, obviously, the, you can put a couple states in here. Um, I can label these states different things. Um, and that's where the functionality kind of ended. That's what I, I, I had a, a project that I needed this for, um, and that's um, where it is. Uh, obviously, in the future, I'd like to add SI units, the ability to draw a line, things like this. And uh, if anyone really wants that, they can add it themselves, right? Because this will be this is free for anyone to contribute, and this will always be free. Yep. You have them get it. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to know how to make this or something, you can check it out as well. Now I haven't downloaded PNG, but honestly, since this is vector art, like you can you know zoom in, and this will be good at any resolution. So if you have a 4K monitor and you have this take up the whole screen. Um, it's going to be a very high density psychometric chart because a lot of times you go to these these websites and it's all grainy and then you print it out and it's even worse and now I can't even you know you're trying to take an exam and see you know it's a big difference on some of these um, you know big percentage you can't read the chart properly so I took a lot of effort to make it look nice okay so that is that's psychrochart.com The next one in my spare time is excel-psychometrics.com. I figured that was a halfway decent domain because you'll see it basically deals with doing psychometrics in spreadsheets. And I wanted to not just say spreadsheets psychometrics because that sounds silly, right? Most people think, oh, Excel, right? Something people can latch on to. So if you go to excel-psychometrics.com, um, there's not a lot of UI on this page. Um, and it may be a little bit unknown what this is for, but what this is for is to quickly do the psychometric calculations in spreadsheets. So I program in lots of different languages. I have to do psychometrics all the time as an HVAC engineer. I cannot tell you how many times I have re-implemented the, the methods of psychometric calculations in various languages. And every time I'm doing this saturated pressure for water, I swear I get the constants wrong, you know. I'm sick of typing in those 13 constants over and over again, the Highland and Wexter constants. So I decided, once and for all, I'm going to build myself a little equation compiler in some sense. So you can start from any of uh, the two parameters that you normally start with. So dry bulb relative humidity, dry bulb dew point, dry bulb wet bulb. And I'm going to do an example here. If you start with dry bulb relative humidity, I can type in my kind of initial cells. So let's say I'm over here in my spreadsheet, and I have, let's say, 75 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity. And I need all of these parameters. Okay? I don't know exactly what everyone else would do. Right? Some may try to go find that in. Some may go. I would open up my fundamentals book and start doing some, some equations. Well, this kind of helps solve that because I can put in okay, that dry bulb cell was B1, this was B2, and if you were paying real close attention, you would see all of those changing in my formulas. Right? Now it looks like a big mess, and it kind of is, but if I just want enthalpy, I could copy this to clipboard, drop this, drop this into here, and I have it. All right? So 
I've kind of skipped all the preliminary steps. Usually I do this uh, like in an algorithm. I usually go like, uh, you know, temperature and ranking, partial pressure in the order you see here. But you can kind of jump wherever you need to. If I need something quick, now it's not very efficient. So the normal way you're, you're kind of supposed to use this tool is kind of go start at the bottom here. I'll start by grabbing the saturated partial pressure. I'll copy that. I'll paste that. And then I'll come back here and I'll put, where did I put that cell? So I put that in B4. So now you see all of the cells, all the things that reference partial pressure kind of, they've been shrunk, right? Because I already have that stored and that's now replaced by B4. So now I can go partial pressure. I can put that here. And that's in B5. I can do humidity ratio. Put that there. That's in B6. And then I can just literally copy the rest of them. So you can see my enthalpy formula has really shrunk down. This is kind of the, the root, you know, the, the formula you would see in the textbook. It's 0.24 times 10 plus omega, you know, 1061.444, right? But before when you saw it with that big one, you know, it's referencing omega, which was referencing the partial pressure, which was referencing all of this other stuff. But as you can see here, I just went to my sheet, changed a couple variable cells, and now I'm done with my psychometrics. And this is so much better than having like a custom add-in. I've tried that. Every time I get a new computer, I don't have the add-in. I share the Excel spreadsheet with somebody. They don't have the add-in. Custom functions break on people. Here, it's all transparent. I just get it right when I need it. And if I was doing not just like single things and you were going to like drag these formulas down, you can just remember that you can type anything in here. So if I needed the, the dollar signs in Excel to make these absolute references, you can do that. If I'm doing a programming language, and this is really like dry ball variable, I could then copy this and paste it into my, as long as like, you know, your, your programming language has addition and division and multiplication with the normal symbols, you're usually pretty good to go. You may have to change some of the if statements a little bit, but at least you, do, you don't have to type those constants over and over again. So that's excel-psychometrics.com. So if you're in 664 and you need a quick, quick do that and you don't want to spend your whole afternoon figuring out why your partial pressure is wrong, you know, you can come back here and check it. And I'm pretty sure these are all right. You may want to double check me. But... And again, this is all, if people want to add capability, I welcome contributions. I, I don't have all that much time. Okay. So that kind of ends that first little half. Those are kind of like two little side projects, I think, as teasers to get you interested. And from here, I want to, I'm going to, we're going to kind of go abstract about computing, and then I'm going to come back and bring it to some more concrete examples. Okay. So the first thing I want to get off the bat is that how, how many of you have heard of the terminal, the shell, or the command line? Okay. So yeah, generally people hear these terms. But what I find is a lot of people don't really understand what they mean, all right? They just think it's, I'm going to the black box, I'm looking like a hacker, I'm working for the NSA kind of thing, and it doesn't have to be that way. So I want to just define a couple terms and then move from there. What is the terminal, okay? This is a, really, this is a terminal, okay? And it kind of comes from, a lot of these terms have a lot of history behind them. These things have been around for a long, long period. And a terminal, in the terms of the types of computer we're talking about, is the end of the line. It is where I, the programmer, am putting input through a keyboard. It's receiving those keystrokes, those scan codes. And then it's sending that in a serial communication line. It used to be an RS-232 line. And that went to a program, right? It turned it. And then it sent back output to the screen. And the terminal then printed it. So the terminal is... Has nothing, the terminal has no concept of a language, of anything. It's literally just, I get input, I pass it on, I get output, and I display that somehow. There are lots of terminal emulator programs out there, because no, no longer do we have like a physical device that is the terminal that's connected by a cable that does serial communication. We have software that now emulates that behavior, and that's how these things still work. So... You have the original console, so if you do cmd.exe, you get this you know, rectangular box. That's a terminal emulator. We have the new Windows terminal, which I'll show you in a second. 
you have Conamu. If you are on a Mac, you're a Mac person, the terminal emulator you'd probably use is iTerm2. If you're in the Linux world, uh, there's tons and tons of choices. So you have GNOME, Xterm, Alacrity or Alacrity, and just so many more. And the, lots and lots of choices. And then there's the shell. Okay? So the shell is, is what is, a, is the language and the construct that you use to actually do commands in the computer. Okay? So what I have here, this is a screenshot of the Windows terminal running a few diff different shells inside of it. So the terminal is this whole thing. It's the window, and it's the presentation, and it's the colors and the blackness, right? And each tab here, like this tab Ubuntu, this tab Windows PowerShell, those are different implementations of different shells, okay? So um, when you have this Ubuntu tab, this is really Bash. Uh, you have Windows PowerShell. You have CMD, which is its own language as a shell. And then you have Azure Cloud Shell, and you can get lots of different shells. And the shell is really dealing with this, this right here, this for i in do print. That's all shell stuff. That has nothing to do with the terminal, right? The terminal is the thing it's running within. What are different shells? The most two common ones, like if you're on a anything that's not Windows, the one you'll probably come across is called Bash, the born again shell. It's been around forever. It's never gonna go away. Okay. Um, Microsoft had cmd.exe or DOS, that's terrible. So they, they did away with that and introduced Windows PowerShell many years back. But then there's all sorts of lesser known ones. There's Z Shell, there's Fish, the friendly interactive shell, New Shell, and lots more. And then we have the command line. Someone says, I'm typing at the command line. The command line is the most abstract of these concepts. The way I like to think of it, if you type in something, you have characters and you press the enter key and something happens, you're working at the command line. So it's, it's actually a more vague, less useful term. It doesn't have as much definition as the other two. And so, just to be clear, you know, when you see people who are new to this kind of computing environment, they'll ask questions that don't make a lot of sense. Like, how do I do a for loop in my terminal? That doesn't make, the terminal has nothing to do with the syntax, right? Or the other way is, how do I change the font or the colors in Bash? Bash has no concept of colors. It Bash is the, the language and the syntax, it's the shell. So it's good to at least have an understanding of like, when you're asking questions, what am I talking about? So we're gonna get a little meta here, okay? Everyone's seen this abstraction of the computer. What does the computer do? You have raw input data, goes through a program, and you get output. Right? And that's a very useful thing for people to understand. But unfortunately, that's where a lot of people stop. That's where they think it ends, okay? If, if you take that one step further, a more improved version of this in computing is thinking of things in a pipeline. So you have input data that goes to a program, it has output, but that output becomes the input to the next program. So I'm, I'm basically using programs as functions, and now I have the possibility to compose those in any way I, I want. And it's the, the combinatorics and the power of function composition that really give you the ability to do whatever you want, and it's the most power in computing. So if you are using a shell like Bash or any of the POSIX-related shells, it usually will look something like this. Program, data, and then you have a pipe symbol. I'm piping that into the next program, into the next program, and, to, and then I redirect it into my final output. Right? This, is, this is the concept of a Unix pipeline. Every program does one thing and does it well, and I pass input from one program to the next. It's not a monolithic program that's doing everything. And that's even not enough. Right? So the way I like to think of it is that you have a series of pipelines. I have many disparate input sources, and I have many transformations that are working on all that input data, and some of these things can depend on each other. You, you have like a dependency tree, and I eventually can get to my output target, which is either a single file or multiple files. Right? And so this is, this is how you build large pieces of software. You use build programs, and you build it from small source code files, and you build them into bigger ones, into bigger ones, into bigger ones, until you get a final executable. But it, it applies to more than just software engineering. It applies to what we do as reproducible uh, analysis and documentation as engineers. Right? I want to have a set of raw data, and I want to go through everything. My modeling, 
my documentation of that model, my output report, and I want that to all be automated. And you may think, how are you going to do this? Is that even possible? It's possible. And it's possible actually using very old tools and very old techniques. And you have very small building blocks, and you put them all together, and you can do kind of really cool things. Okay. So that's way, that's way meta, way pie in the sky when I'm talking about computation. Let, show me some, some real applications. How do I get started? So how I, I, we work in a fully Windows, Microsoft Office 365 environment and command commissioning. I'm never going to get away from it. And so, but what has happened in the last couple of years is Microsoft has really opened things up. They are more open to other operating systems, including Linux, and they have a whole thing called Windows Subsystem for Linux. So if anyone has been interested in things like working in a VM or dual booting, you don't need to do any of that anymore. You just go to the Windows Subsystem for Linux. So to get started, what I would highly suggest is that you go to the Windows Store. You, do a, you don't get you know, games that are going to waste your time, right? You do a search for WSL, Windows Subsystem for Linux, and it knows this search already. It has a kind of a prompt here. Linux on Windows? Totally. Right? Get the apps. And these are, I think, there's more, but these are like their six most popular distributions that you can run. So you have Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, Debian, um, and so I would highly suggest Ubuntu, right? It's got by far the most reviews. It was the first one on the scenes. Microsoft and them work very closely hand in hand together. So it works very seamlessly. And this is not, like I said, this is not a VM. This is like direct integration with Windows. I can use Windows files. I can run Windows.exes without having to rebuild it or do anything. But I also get all this cool Unix free and open source software that you can't always get a, a, an analogous program in Windows. So I would suggest Ubuntu, and that would be a minimum, but you'll get what you'll get is the, the Bash shell is essentially what you get. Um, but it shows up in the original Windows console terminal, which is really hideous. Okay? So I would also suggest that you come in and you get the Windows, Windows terminal. Apparently, I can't miss the S. And it says it's in preview, but it's been in preview for like over a year, and it's actually pretty good. And it actually looks really good. Um, it's modern, fast, powerful, can do emojis, GPU enabled, looks really nice. Okay, and this is what I actually use this as my daily driver when I'm dealing with um, my various shells whether that's Bash or PowerShell. Okay. So if you need to get started, how I would recommend Ubuntu, Windows Terminal, and move on from there. So if you do that, I'll just give you kind of two teaser programs to show you some cool things that, you know, there's unlimited cool things out there, but here are two quick ones that I can kind of show that I think, you know, would have provided me some immediate value had I been aware of them when I was in grad school. So the first one is called units, which all it does is uh, unit conversion, but it does it in a really, really nice way. So I'm going to do an example here of, I'm going to, if any of you have done the Darcy Weisbach in fluids, remember that, okay? It's got a lot of parameters, a lot of units. Who remembers the units for dynamic viscosity? Not many, <laughs> okay? No one, no one knows that, right? So I'll, what I have here on the left is I have Windows Terminal. I'm running Bash Shell. I have units installed. And so I'm over here. We're going to do just an example with, with this right here, and we're going to talk about maybe air. So let's say I have you know 128 divided by pi. Um, what's our length? We have maybe 20 meters of stuff. Um, I don't know if you remember what the dynamic viscosity of air, but I looked it up. It's 0 0.01676 centipoise, right? I have, we'll say, 10,000 CFM of air, and we have maybe a 7.5 inch pipe that we're flowing this through, right? And I want my answer, the PSI. 
and I have it. Okay. I don't know how many different unit conversions I would have had to just do there to get that answer and know it's correct. Because what this also would say, say I missed something, like say instead of to the fourth power, this was to the third power. And I said, I still want PSI, conformability error. These units are not, they don't match when you, when you break it down to the primitive units. Okay. So if I need to check my work in engineering, if I was in thermodynamics and I had to do all these unit conversions and make sure I did it right, I'm doing like velocity, which is meter squared over second squared and kilojoules per kilogram, make sure all these things cancel out, I would have definitely pumped it into here and double checked my answer. And that's all this program really does. And you can add your own units if you need to. Um, but like I said, you know, if I want this in inches, of H2, this literally has every unit you can hardly think of, you know, it's 0.2 inches of water. So that's units. And there's tons of these types of like little utilities. The second is parallel, GNU parallel. How many of you have ever tried to log in to say the, the TAMU supercomputer or anything like that? Okay, so then you had to use Linux, right? You had to SSH and use Bash, right? That's how it's always going to be. And so it pays to have a little bit of knowledge about how to do these types of things because you may want to use a supercomputer to do some really cool things. And I'll, I'll just say, the first time I tried to log in, and I don't know if you know that if you type in a password in a shell, it normally doesn't show anything. It doesn't show like little asterisk characters. And I thought my keyboard was broken. And I kept calling up Tamu IT saying, I can't log into the system. Like every time I go right to it, it stops my keyboard from functioning. Sir, like, you're just in the shell, like, just type your keyboard in and press enter and you'll be on your way. And there I went. All right, so that, I've come a long way, all right? <laughs> so don't be embarrassed like me. <coughs> so to take advantage of a supercomputer, you're doing massively parallel computations. And a lot of people don't really have a concept of, like, how do I, how do, I do that? Like, how am I going to get started? Well, parallel is a program that lets you do that. So let's say... Um, I was uh, doing a bunch of energy plus. Um, I have a bunch of energy plus files. And say I have n number of these. So I got, I got seven IDF files. And I want to run them all in parallel. They all take 30 minutes each on a normal computer. So I want to speed that up. Right? So instead of it taking all afternoon, it takes just one run. Now we're on a supercomputer. How can I do that? Well, parallel lets you kind of in a really nice, simple syntax, run these types of things. So I'm not actually going to run anything in parallel. I'm just going to kind of show an example. So imagine I had energyplus.exe, and I could put like a placeholder for all those files that were in that record, and then I could, I could pipe that in. So that actually did just run in parallel. I could have put a timer to make it more fancy. you know. But if you can imagine, that's how simple it would be to utilize a supercomputer to do many energy plus runs. That's, and this is a built-in uh, utility that's in most Linux distributions. And that's parallel. Okay? So those are just two of a seemingly endless world of software that nobody has even been aware of, but has, has existed for decades. Okay? These are old, tried and true pieces of software, which I really like. I want to give another example here of a tool that we use heavily at command commissioning for building documentation. So there's a lot of times where we'll do you know detailed reports and we do a lot of modeling and we'll do like modeled savings and then we need to get that into a final report which goes to a PDF to the client. Okay? And there, I can't tell you how many last minute tweaks there always are, right? So, oh, tweak how we do this one thing and it changes all of my results. I gotta copy it, gotta paste it over. And to me, that is no bueno, right? I, I as I've been in software long enough, I want to automate everything. So I wanna build my Word doc. How am I gonna build a, a Word doc from start to finish? You can do it using a combination of a markup language called Markdown and then Pandoc to actually do the, the conversion. So if you go to Pandoc, website, Pandoc's a universal document converter, and you can kind of read the about page here, but 
Basically, if you need to go from one document type to another, Pandoc is the way to go. I want to go from doc to PDF. I mean, they have this kind of visualization down here that's a bit overkill of like, here's all the con like, I get it. If I multiply 100 by 100, I get 10,000, right? This is combinatorics at its best, but you turn it into a vector image. Um, so you can do all sorts of cool stuff. But the way that we utilize it most is we use um, Markdown, which is a markup language that's it's simplified, and it kind of forces you to do things in a more simpler way, but it lets you, because it's a text format, I can now use other programs to create it, and I can inject, and I can um, include other files, and then I can turn it all into a Word document. Okay. So we're, we're doing pretty good on time. So let me see if I have, I'll just do a couple. So this is what um, Markdown will look like. So it's very simple, and this is just a text file. But it kind of it strips away all the noise of normal markup languages. So I'll kind of zoom in here. You can do things like, this is a heading. Anytime you see a pound sign, that's a heading. If I have more pound signs, that's deeper levels. So I have a heading one, executive summary. You have normal text. You can do italics like this. You can do bold. And even my particular text editor here made it a little bit bold, which is kind of interesting. Um, links, you can do lists, bulleted lists, figures. So this shells.png is actually a PNG in that folder, and it will put that into my Word doc here in a second. You can do tables, and then you can even put in really nice mathematics, and it uses the normal LaTeX notation that many, many tools use. So this is the Euler equation. So again, you can type this by hand if you want, but again, the real power comes in the sense that I could type part of my document up like this, but then I could put a section that is generated from another tool, all of my simulation results as a table, and I just concatenate those two text files together, and now I have my new report. And I can do this all at the same time. So I can now do Pandoc, um, and you can also apply your own styling. So if I'm going to a Word doc, um, there's methods, so this is this is actually, this is our real life command commissioning uh, brand standard that I came up with. If you don't like it, well, too bad for you. <laughs> um, but this kind of sets up like, this is how all of these things will be mapped out. So it's all branded real nice. So when I'm building this, I can call that reference file. I can go reference doc equals pandoc and uh, template, I think, dot docx. I want my output is output dot docx, and we had that file sample dot markdown. So whew, live presentations get a little nervous, right? <laughs> so I just made this output dot docx, so if I go to that and I open that up, you'll see all of that, all of that, you know, markup language has now been turned in directly into Word, and it's all formatted the way I like it for command commissioning reports. This is all, you know, command blue. Here's my figure. Here is my table that is in our style, you know. And so I, I don't have to worry about all of that stuff. I just focus literally on getting the raw input data, which is that text file, which is my report. And, but because of that, I can have that report go through a series of transformations before it gets to its final place, before it gets to here. And this is how you can kind of build Along with my model, I say build model, it also builds my documentation, or my report. And there's your mathematics. So that's Panda. All right. We're going through a lot here. Let me just take a look. Yeah. Okay, so. We're getting to the kind of the final granddaddy of, of building projects here. The interesting thing to remember is often, you know, there is a lot of repetitive work. You know, you, you do a you do the you do a study and then after six months you gotta do the same thing again. 
And when you have something like this, your second six months report, you know how long that takes. Yeah. Right? That's that's the key. So if you're doing MRE, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. and you have to do it every six months for the next five years, you did this once this way, now the you know the next report is gonna take orders of magnitude time less. Yeah, and what well, we're about to go in here now is building entire projects using build tools. Okay. And the one that I use most often is called Make. Make is three, four decades old. Okay. This is how the Linux kernel is built. This is how tons and tons of software is built. And what it is is a build system. Okay, it's one of many build automation tools. There's Ant and MS Build and all sorts of different things. But Make is tried and true. It has really some weird arcane syntax and had to stay backwards compatible for a really long time. So there are definitely some like dark edges to it. But what's nice is that once you know it, you know it for good and it's gonna be around for decades to come. And so if any of you have ever gone to like a piece of software and there's installation instructions and you come across these two most famous commands, make, pseudo make install, okay? What that's using is the make program to build the project. And what the first line is doing is doing actual, the actual building. It's taking source code files and then turning it in C, building its like source code to object files and then links it and all that. But it's literally doing whatever you want, whatever you put into the make file. And then sudo make install, all that's doing is moving stuff to somewhere in your path. And that's all these two commands are doing. But this is how I think about my engineering projects. I sit down, I have my raw input, and when I'm ready to go, I type make. And it does everything I need to do, whether that's the modeling, that's the documentation, whatever it may be. And the basics of make is three things. You have these lines here. You have a target, the files you needed to make it, the prerequisites, and then the recipe. How do I make it? What is that shell command line thing to do it? Okay. So for instance, what if I was to make a make file of what I just did, the target I was trying to make was report.docx. What it needs prior to make it is the markdown version. And then the recipe, how I make it is pandoc, reference doc, and actually, I should have put this template up here as well, because that's a prerequisite. If that changes, I'll need to rerun it again. And then when I want to actually get that, or I want to run that, that, that target, I can just put make my target. And so when you see make with nothing, it's making the default target. But you know, you're always making something. right? But you got to think about, you know, I, I think of this more, less like C programming language building. I see this as anything I want. What is my target's? What are the prerequisites that need to happen before you can do that? And what make is good for is that this is better than a build script, okay? Because you could always just build a script that does everything start to finish. Um, the problem is that when your projects get really big and your steps take really, really long, what you want to do is only make the parts you need to. Okay, so make does all the dependency tracking to know, okay, if this input file hasn't changed, and I've already made that before, I don't need to redo that. I only redo exactly what I need. And so, and it also helps you document your whole engineering process. So how did I get from my raw input to my final thing? And it's reproducible. If I come back to this engineering project six months later and I have no idea how I made this figure, is how it normally happens if you don't have some sort of written out documentation. This is self-documented. So let's go into, this is a real life example. Um, we were tasked to um, do some savings estimation and we were required to do energy plus modeling. So how many of you have done energy plus modeling? Okay, cool, right? Energy plus, it's got its pros, it's got its cons, right? Pros, what they got right is that its input, if anyone of you have actually opened up an IDF file, is a simple text file. That is exactly what they needed to do. Right? And that's what the government needed to spend no more money. They needed to make a program that takes text, turns it, and gets you text output that can then be pre-processed or post-processed to your heart's content. So I do things a little differently. A lot of people will go to SketchUp, they'll make their geometry like that. Um, they'll go to the IDF runner, they'll do that. They may use Open Studio. Ah, it's not good enough for me. Okay. <laughs> so I actually will 
do parts of my energy plus IDF file, I will generate from as few parameters as I, as I need. Okay? So I actually make all my geometry. I, well, I'll, it'll be clear here in a second. I'll show you. Okay? But I basically can do all of this, the entire energy plus modeling process in make using my shell. So that's the last slide. So we'll go into some real life files. So some of them are a little messy. I didn't have time to like fully break them out. But uh, so for me, when I think about the geometry of buildings and energy plus, what I look at like how can I parameterize my geometry? Of course, you can't open Excel file until you escape that. Okay. How can I parameterize my geometry to as few factors as possible? And to me, most of the time that ends up being like the X, Y coordinates of the building and the zones, my floor height, my window to wall ratio. I don't really care where the windows show up. I just want the right area and I want them on the right faces. Um, and that's about it, right? And then maybe the wall, I can put in my wall construction. But if, I, if you give me that information, I can derive all the other vertices and the vectors and the objects I need for energy plus. And so that's what I usually do. So a lot of times I'll, I'll use Excel because I can do a couple of different um, you know, formulas. This is a little zoomed in. But essentially you can understand I zoned this building into exterior and four, or four exterior, one interior zone here. I choose a window to wall ratio. And I have coordinates here, x, y coordinates, and I mark whether it's an exterior zone or not. Okay. I also can put in different information about my zones. I want to parameterize my zone equipment. I, I know what it's going to look like, but what I will change is the like CFM per square foot, my minimum flow. Because unfortunately, you can't do that in Energy Plus. You have to like put an actual flow number, but I always want it to be uh, normalized to my square footage. If I change that, I need to change everything else. So everything needs to be formula-based. And then for my equipment, you know, you usually get this type of information from mechanical schedules. So I can put this all in. And really, I want this type of information to be injected into my model. And this, is, this file here is kind of my raw input. All right? So this is where I start. So if it's in Excel, it's not um, super, like, available. Remember, if you're going to do this type of stuff, Text is the ultimate medium to transfer things from one program to the next. Right? And so that's why it's so important to be able to understand how to build pipelines using just text. Right? So if I want, for instance, information out of that Excel file, I have a program that does one thing and one thing well. It extracts out information from Excel files. Okay? And so this is homegrown because, you know, if I was lucky, I would work in a place that everyone didn't use Excel and we did all things you know, software. But that's not the reality of things. I'm going to use Excel. I'm going to be in Microsoft World a long time. So I need to build myself a couple of little shims to help me out. So I have a tool called Excel Chop. I give myself the, uh, the worksheet, RTUs. I'll say the range was three, column A to P. It's smart enough to go down until it's in, uh, out of rows. And that file was called Geometry. It's actually not an SI. A, and if I do that, that program's job, all it does is go to the Excel file and puts it on the standard output because this is going to be the beginning of the pipeline. So I could take this data, I could store it in a file, or I could start piping this into other programs. So I have a program that then can do a template fill. And basically what it does is it, for each one of those records, it filled in a template, right? And now I have all this output. So this is actual Energy Plus IDF code. This is object files. So there's a lot that came out, but you're seeing the very last object here, which is RTU4 supply fan. And let me show where that, that template came from. So what I do is I have these templates here where every number one is replaced by the name of the object, so RTU1, right? 
And so I don't know if, if you guys have been in trying to make sure all your nodes match in Energy Plus, but that can be a real pain in the behind. You know, and so I got a couple of these little templates that I have in my back pocket that I can reuse on different projects. So if I have a simple VAV system, um, I can do that. And it's, it's parameterized down to just the things I care about. So Energy Plus does have a bit of a templating. You can do some simple stuff, but if you actually look at what you have to define for that object, it's like 70 fields long. You have no idea what it's actually doing behind the scenes. Um, and it's not flexible for, for new things. So I can make any template I want here. So number one is, like I said, the first column. Number three would be the third column. So like number three should correspond to right here, right? That's the data from that file. And then I made all of those things. So then, so now I basically, uh, I had that, I had that output. And now I can store that in a file for the time being. And if I actually um, open up my IDF file, you'll see, like, for some of this stuff, I, I do actually put the schedules in here because, like, that this serves as my input. I don't need to copy it over from Excel. I can do it right in here. But for things like the walls, the roofs, the floors, and the RTUs, you'll see I have a little special syntax here, okay? It's called include. So what happens is I run that command, I build all the text I need for the RTUs, and then I just have a statement here called include, and when I'm ready to go to actually do the model, that line gets replaced by what's in that file. So I'm in here, basically as long as that raw data in my Excel file is correct and my templates are right, I'm good to go, and I need, never need to worry about it. And the RTUs is one thing, but you know, if I go look at this file, I probably should, I think I should have it built. This file is 1,900 lines long of vertices for my walls, windows, and floors. But because I built it from formulas and equations, I know it is exactly perfect to what I want. And you'll notice also, because I put it in, it's not coming from SketchUp, you don't have like 25 decimal places of random significant figures you know, I kept it to integers, integer meters if I could, and so it's a much simpler, much simpler thing, okay? So, okay, that's great. So here is the real life, this is the down and dirty. I didn't spice it up for this presentation. This was the make file that makes all of this happen, okay? So you'll see a bunch of kind of main variables, so I have a pointer to like what actual Energy Plus I'm running. And then you'll start seeing that syntax I showed before, target and all the prerequisites and then recipes. Now this is kind of, this is called a phony target. This is, I don't have too much time. I'm just trying to make you aware of these things. But we can go, I can just show you that, that line that I ran with Excel chop before. Here's where that line actually happened in my make file. So I needed to build this RTU info.txt this was the input. This is where it comes from. I run Excel chop. This, that worksheet, this range, this is shorthand syntax for the prereq. This is shorthand syntax for the output if I change the name. Okay, so this, some arcane things. But the basic gist of it is I have all these different targets and prereqs, but eventually what I want to do is run the main default target way here at the top. And if I have this baseline, that's my whole thing. Now, what's also nice is if I if I open up this IDF file, um, a lot of projects want you to do savings estimation for each individual measure, okay? which I somewhat disagree about because measures have interactive effects, and it really makes sense only in the entirety of the package. And yes, while you can account in in like steps of order. If you change the order, the importance of different ones changes, right? And so I never liked that. But they want you to do it anyways. So if I have six ECMs I'm applying to this model, i got to run this Energy Plus model once for the baseline and once for all six ECMs. And each one of these takes a minute to run. The other problem I run into is that when I want to make a change to my baseline, I would traditionally have to go ahead and change all of the other ECM IDF files, which is a huge pain. 
So what, what did I do? Took it upon myself to make a little quick syntax where in the comment on the right side here, I can put like replace ECM number and then the text that I want it to be replaced with. So that it's really all one file. So if I make a change to what was happening in the baseline, the ones that are running with the ECM get that for free. There's just a transformation. If I'm running ECM one, it'll replace this one single line and keep everything else. Okay. So I'm only making changes in one place, no matter how many ECMs that I have. And then the final grand thing here is if um, uh, you have make and it has a knowledge of all the dependencies for all this stuff, it can parallelize. So if two trees don't really depend on each other, they can run them at the same time. So when I want to make this whole thing, I want to make all of my ECMs, I want to do my documentation, I type make and I put a dash J, which will make it in parallel. So when I do this, you'll see, because I've modified that Excel spreadsheet, it's doing a lot of stuff, right? It extracted information about geometry, it built it, and this is six different Energy Plus models running all at the same time. Right? And each one, like, again, this saves me 6x time because I'm not running it six times. And, you know, we'll see. This surface is not quite as fast as my desktop computer. Um, but you'll see, not only does it run it, but then even after that, I post process some of the data. Uh, I think I make a couple quick charts, and then we got to put this information into a spreadsheet that goes to the final people. They like, they have a spreadsheet template that we have to fill in. It's like calibration and stuff, and I got to get my stuff in there. And so instead of filling that in every time I run a model, I have the whole thing being built. So we're at what? A couple models are at September here. Energy Plus, way too slow, by the way. I, it's much slower than it needs to be. And you need way more objects than you should to make anything viable. To make a single duct VAV system, you need like 20 Energy Plus objects. So, should just be about finishing. So what did it, it says how much? Oh, it took two minutes. So this is all post-processing stuff. This is getting like peak demands and stuff. There's my CV and RMC. And then I have it print some pretty plots for me, right? That all ran parallel. And this was 